So I'll, I'll start more formally and welcome everybody to this uh, Theravada Monday evening class at the Buddhist Society. Uh, very special evening because we have Achan Chandasiri taking the class. Um, the monastic community has been on retreat, uh, so-called winter retreat, when they from Christmas um, up to the end of March, beginning of April, um, everything goes quiet, and uh, they go on full retreat mode, minimizing contact with the world. And uh, so it's it's lovely to to, to have Ajahn Chandasiri back. She'll be here with us next week, all being well. And I believe there'll be another one or two occasions when she'll be taking a class. There's always a very special quality about uh, teachings from the monastic community because their lifestyle is so different uh, to our lay lifestyle. It uh, tends to elicit and help cultivate qualities that uh, we perhaps struggle with a bit more in developing because we have to deal with so many other things in daily life, lay life, that monastics don't but they have a very intensive uh, practice uh, in, in a supportive community and are much more permeated by the Dhamma in terms of everyday uh, events than, than most of us. So um, I'd like to say just a few words about Ajahn Chandasiri, who uh, many of you uh, know from previous classes, but she was born in Scotland in 1947 and was brought up as a Christian uh, she then trained and worked as an occupational therapist, mainly in the field of mental illness. And then in 1977, um, her interest in meditation led her to meet Achan Sumedho um, shortly after he arrived from Thailand. And like many individuals uh, since, uh, very inspired by his teachings, um, she um, was inspired to uh, take on monastic training at Chithurst as, as one of the first four Anagarikas, which is... Um, uh, a female postulant, I would believe, uh, is the English equivalent. And she's been very actively involved in the monastic community in developing the nuns' Vinaya training, the, the, the code of discipline. Um, and she's guided many meditation retreats for lay people and uh, enjoys participating in Christian Buddhist dialogue. I believe she's led a number of retreats with uh, Christian monastics, um, sharing uh, perspectives uh, which they have in common. And then in 2015, she established uh, the Milpuim Hermitage in Scotland, where she now normally resides. And thanks to the wonders of technology, we see her in our screens wherever we happen to be in the United Kingdom or the world for that matter, because I don't know where everybody's from. So sister, if I may pass uh, the baton over to you. Thank you very much for coming, for joining us. Uh, very welcome. Uh, and lovely to see you and um, looking forward to this evening's class and reflections. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Just to correct a small thing, I actually came to Milne in 2011. Oh, so I've been right. here more than 10 years. Okay. And, um, nice. Anyway, I'm, I'm very happy to be here and I'm very happy to have this opportunity to spend time with you all, uh, reflecting on what is most precious in our lives, uh, the teachings of the Buddha, the Dhamma that uh, can guide us to perfect, pre perfect peace and freedom, liberation from every kind of suffering. So what we usually do at the start of these classes is to, um, I'll light the candles and incense on the shrine, and then we'll do a short puja, and we'll chant in Pali this evening, um, a shortened form of the evening chanting, which will be shared on the screen. And so you're very welcome to join in if you would like to, um, but please, please stay muted. And uh, then we'll go step by step from there. Thank you.
Yatitam chakani purisa yukani yata purisa pokala. Esa padawato sa watasan pok. Ahuneyo pahuneyo takineyo hanchali karaniyo. Anum daran punya ke tanda tasati. So for those of you who are maybe not familiar with Theravada Buddhism, uh, that was the usual uh, traditional uh, homage that we pay to the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha. Uh, we chant in the Pali language, which is a language that is not generally spoken nowadays, but they say it's pretty close to the language that the Buddha actually would have taught in uh, 2,500 years ago. So it has a particular kind of energy, particular kind of vibrancy. And it is a, when we learn how to chant in Pali, it means that wherever we go, when we go to Theravada Buddhist countries, or if we go on pilgrimage in India, uh, we'll be able to join in with whatever chanting is happening there. It's like the sort of common language of all the uh, Buddhist traditions, or at least the Southern school, the Theravada school. So um, although we don't actually understand the meaning of the words, it has a particular flavor for us. And, those of us who've been practicing for many years uh, can feel quite um, stirred, quite affected hearing these words, namo tasa, and so on. The, uh, what we do now is to have a chance for people to request the three refuges and the five precepts. And I'll say a little bit about that before Nick actually makes the formal request on behalf of the group. Uh, this is an opportunity to um, make a kind of resolution, a determination uh, to live according to the basic guidelines that the Buddha uh, presented for us as human beings living in the, in the world. Uh, so the refuges, which we'll um, recite first, um, are the refuge in the Buddha, which is both the historical figure of the Buddha, but also the capacity that each one of us has to see clearly uh, that which is wise and compassionate. I often think of it as being you know, the quality of the heart um, as opposed to the head, which is very much about the intellect. The, the Buddha is a, a knowing and seeing clearly through that faculty of, of intuition, a heart intuition. So we take refuge in the Buddha. We take refuge in the Dhamma, which is what the Buddha knows. Some people say like, what does the Buddha know that human beings don't know? And the, the, the Buddha knows the Dhamma, the truth. And again, this is a capacity that each one of us has uh, to experience the truth directly, to see the truth clearly. When we live in a way that is fully present with things as they are, Again, the thinking mind can pull us far away from the present moment, uh, thinking about the future, thinking about the past. Uh, whereas when we take refuge in Dharma, our anchor is in this moment, as we know it directly for ourselves. Dharma is also the teachings of the Buddha that point to that truth, that encourage us to uh, cultivate that awareness um, of the present moment. Little by little, as we live our lives in Dhamma, what we find is a growing confidence that this is a way of life, a way of practice that can bring us great benefit. Uh, whereas often our good ideas, they don't always work out in the best possible way. Um, when we take refuge in Dhamma, uh, when we're really present with, with things, usually I found that uh, 
the result is a, a sense of, of peacefulness and well-being. And even if things go wrong, there is the capacity to uh, respond in a skillful way. The Sangha are those who attempt to live skillfully following the teachings of the Buddha. So the Buddha lived and taught 2,500 years ago and during his life, many people uh, gathered, were attracted by the quality of presence of the Buddha, by his teachings. And through his teachings, his example, they um, practiced in the same way, um, living out these teachings, applying these teachings uh, to their own lives and found benefit. Uh, they then uh, were able to pass on, to share this understanding with others. So over countless generations, men and women have uh, practiced according to these teachings, have passed on their understanding uh, to others right up to the present day. So the Sangha is like the community, the congregation, those who practice. And uh, being with other people of like mind, even though we're physically separated, just seeing each other on little tiny screens, there is a sense of connection. I certainly feel a sense of connection with you all, even though I'm far away up in Scotland. Uh, there's a, a quality of, of connectedness with, with other people, practicing, having a similar interest and aspiration. And this can be a great support to us. So these are the refuges that we determine. And then the five precepts, refraining from deliberately causing harm to other beings, uh, deliberately stealing, uh, sexual misconduct, uh, lying, in, inappropriate speech, unskillful speech, and the use of intoxicants. And so um, I'd like to invite Nick to make the formal request, and then I'll, I'll offer the refuges and precepts in the traditional way. Over to you, Nick. Thank you. Maya Maya Tisaranena Saha Pancha Silani Yachama Duti Ampi Maya Maya Tisaranena Saha Pancha Silani Yachama Tati Ampi Maya Maya Tisaranena Saha Pancha Silani Yachama so Nick has made the request on behalf of everybody and I invite you to to join me, to uh, repeat after me these words. Um, if you prefer just to, to watch and listen, that's fine. Um, but it is an opportunity for those who like to do this to formally affirm the refuges and the precepts. So to start with, I'll recite Namo Tassa three times, and then you can recite it three times, and, and Nick will do it out loud. And then we'll just go line by line after that. <clears throat> Namo Tassa Bhagavato Harahato Samma Sambodhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Harahato Samma Sambodhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Harahato Samma Sambodhasa Namo tassa bhagavato harahato samma sambudhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato harahato samma sambudhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato harahato samma sambudhasa. Udhang saranangachami. Buddham Saranam Gachami Dhammam Saranam Gachami Dhammam Saranam Gachami Sangham Saranam Gachami Sangham Saranam Gachami Dutiyampi Buddham Saranam Gachami Dutiyampi Buddham Saranam Gachami Dutiyampi Dhammam Sarananga Chami Dutiampi Dhammam Sarananga Chami Dutiampi Sankhang Sarananga Chami Dutiampi Sankhang Sarananga Chami 
Tatiyam pi budhang saranam gachami. Tatiyam pi budhang saranam gachami. Tatiyam pi dhammang saranam gachami. Tatiyam pi dhammang saranam gachami. Tatiyam pi sangham saranam gachami. Tatiyam pi sangham saranam gachami. Ye sarana gamana niti tang. Say ama aye. Ama aye. Sorry, missed that point. Yep. Thank you. Now the precepts. Panati pata, where of money, seek her padang, somebody hami. Anatipata veremani sekhapadam samadhyami. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. Adinadhana veremani sekhapadam samadhyami. Adina dana veremani sekapadam samadhyami. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. Kame sumi chachara veremani sekapadam samadhyami. Kame su me chachara veremani sekhapadam samadhyami. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. Musawada veremani sekhapadam samadhyami. Musawada veremani sekhapadam samadhyami. I undertake the precept to refrain from lying. I undertake the precept to refrain from lying. Dura miraya majapamada tana veremani sekhapadam samadhyami. Sura Maraya Maja Pamadatana Veremani Sekhapadam Samadhyami. I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs <clears throat> which lead to carelessness. I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs which lead to carelessness. Imani pancha si kapadani si lena so cutting yanti si lena boga sampada si lena ne putting yanti to sama si lang we so die. Shall I say it in English? Sadu sadu sadu. Just sadu 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 then. Sadu sadu sadu. Very good. Thank you. So thank you very much, Nick. Um, so we've had our, our time of paying homage to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. We've had the time of um, affirming our commitment to living in accordance with the refuges and the uh, pri uh, precepts, which are the ethical guidelines. And now uh, we have an opportunity to practice some meditation. Um, we always call it like practicing meditation or cultivating the practice of meditation, because although um, it seems very, very simple and the guidelines I'm going to offer uh, when I uh, guide the retreat, uh, the guide the meditation are very simple, um, it's not always very easy because our habits, the mental habits that we have. Um, the mind is very impressionable. So what usually happens at the end of a busy day, like when we come together for meditation like this, is that the mind is racing, you know, especially if you've had a very um, hectic day with all kinds of different things happening to you, traveling here, there and everywhere, conversations, uh, different incidents, events, 
different responsibilities, things working out well, things not working out well, the mind tends to be a bit of a flurry of activity. So I'll be guiding us to focus on the breath and the mind will maybe stay with one or two breaths and then it'll get back into a kind of agitated cycle. But what I um, suggest is if you just keep coming back, keep coming back, keep coming back, gently guiding, encouraging, supporting uh, the awareness just to rest with the breath, with the body, little by little, there's a little bit of a settling of the mind because you're conditioning it in a, a way towards calm rather than the usual uh, conditioning that happens in our daily life. When we have a hectic daily life. Uh, the mind is just naturally hectic. That's what happens. So it's not really a personal thing. It's not something we need to feel uh, blame ourselves for um, or feel inadequate about, but just more, this is a fact. This is the way the mind is. So meditation is partly about calming the mind and also about just observing the mind, learning that it has these particular qualities. It is impressionable. It is affected by things. Um, it does change. And the other thing that's most important is that we don't need to identify with it. So these are things we'll talk a bit more about later on. So first of all, I encourage you to find a, a suitable posture. I'm going to sit cross-legged. So if you'd like to do that, you can do that. Um, or if you, prefer, if you find it easier just to sit in a chair, prefer to sit in a chair, that's fine. Um, what we want to do is to establish a posture that is reasonably comfortable and that suggests an attitude of um, alertness, of poise, balance, a sense of being collected, gathered. So we're not kind of all over the place, but the body itself is, is nicely gathered, collected. I suggest that you hold the head up. So the eyes, you know, if you have your eyes open, they're looking straight ahead. And you're welcome to sit, continue to sit with the eyes open. This is helpful if you're very sleepy, meditating with the eyes open. But I'm imagining most of you would prefer to close the eyes, and that's fine as well. But if you do find you're getting a little bit sleepy, dozing off, then I suggest you open your eyes, open them wide. So we establish the posture and if you prefer, and if you're feeling quite alert, then gently close the eyes. This is helpful because we're actually bringing the awareness inwards. We're focusing on this being here, sitting here, rather than being drawn out into what's happening around us. We're bringing the awareness into the body itself. How does the body feel? How do we know that we have a body? What are the signs? Feeling of pressure as you sit, contact with the chair or the mat or the floor. Feeling of warmth in the body, the sensations in the trunk of the body, body sitting nicely upright, the head perched on the top, nicely balanced. If you find it helpful just to move the body around slightly, just gently swaying, maybe round in a circle or from one side to the other. Just seeing how if you tip to one side too much, you tend to topple over and tip too much forward, you topple over forwards, backwards the same. Just finding the middle point, the point of balance, the very fine point, this point of balance. Sometimes people find it helpful to visualize or imagine a column of light or energy extending down through the crown of the head and into the earth. So we align ourselves with this column of energy. Passing down through the spine into the earth. And 
gently taking the awareness around the body, relaxing the body. Sometimes it's helpful to imagine that we can use the breath energy for this, breathing through the different parts of the body, releasing tension, drawing the healing breath energy into the heart center, directing it to different parts of the head, relaxing the skull and the face. Allowing the scalp to become soft, to loosen, allowing the face to become quite loose, quite soft with no particular expression. Releasing tension from around the shoulder area. Letting the shoulders drop. Breathing down through the arms and the hands. Letting the hands rest loosely on the knees or in the lap. Bringing the awareness into the trunk of the body. The top part of the trunk, the chest area the heart center, breathing away any feeling of tightness or constriction around the heart, allowing it to open, softening, opening the heart center. Releasing tension from around the solar plexus, the middle part of the body. Breathing through, settling, calming in the solar plexus area. Breathing down into the belly, taking a very long, slow, easy inhalation, filling the whole torso, the torso expands. And then after a short pause, releasing, breathing out, breathing out fully and completely just enjoying the sense of ease that can come about through this deep belly breathing. Taking two or three really deep, slow, long, easy inhalations and exhalations. It's almost as though we're setting aside a heavy load, putting it to one side for now, and enjoying the sense of ease, a sense of lightness that this brings. Now we breathe down through the legs, releasing tension from the muscles of the legs, the thighs and around the knees, the calves, ankles and feet. And now bringing the awareness into the back part of the body, the muscles around the spine, releasing tension from around the spine, 
beginning at the base of the skull. And gently, almost like massaging on the inside, muscles around the neck, the back of the shoulders, back of the chest, into the waist, and right down into the base of the spine. So that we have the body held nicely upright, but without any undue strain or tension. Sitting upright, breathing in an easy, natural way. Using this normal process of breathing as a focus for the awareness, an anchor. As we're aware of the breath, we're fully present with the breath as it happens here and now. Gently turning aside from any distracting thoughts, even the most wonderful, interesting ideas or plans or memories, we leave them be for now, staying with the breath, one breath, and then the next breath, breathing in, breathing out, fully present and aware. Enjoying the sensation of the body breathing. If you find it helpful, you can use a word or a phrase to support that awareness. Wood as you breathe in, do as you breathe out, or some other word or phrase to support that awareness.
If at any point you notice that the mind has been hijacked by some interesting idea or plan about something in the future, or hijacked by some memory or regret in the past, then simply come back to the next breath. Re-establish that present moment attentiveness. If the mind is very restless, you may need to do that many, many times. You need to be very, very patient just to keep coming back and unflustered, gentle, kindly, but firm way. This breath, this moment, here, now. One breath, and then the next breath. So simple.
keep relaxing, keep enjoying the sensation of the body breathing. It's not a competition, just enjoy our own breathing of the body. One breath, and then the next breath. Simple enough, and yet not always so easy. One breath, and then the next breath. the last few moments, I suggest you introduce the phrase, may this being be well. Just linking it with the breath from time to time as a way of really supporting well-being in yourself, supporting a kindly attitude to yourself, rather than being overly critical about how well you've done or not, may this being be well. So I'd like to offer a few reflections on the Dhamma, the teachings of the Buddha, as a support and encouragement for everybody in their practice. We seem to be living through a very extraordinary time. Uh, one way or another. And first of all, the pandemic. Uh, 
almost two years of major upheaval in people's lives and times of really quite extreme restriction on what we could do, where we could go, our contact with each other. And uh, a time of uh, concern, fear, um, and major challenge, I think, for many, many people. Uh, interestingly, many of my Buddhist friends and uh, colleagues, should we say, uh, after the initial shock, uh, found, found the time very pleasant, actually. Uh, they were glad to be able to, to stay put. They enjoyed the solitude. Uh, they weren't troubled by the lack of contact um, or relatively untroubled by it. Um, didn't mind the restriction, enjoyed the quiet. Uh, no aeroplanes going over, much less traffic. Uh, but for a great many people, there was enormous suffering. The suffering of the restrictions, the suffering of contracting the illness, and the suffering of bereavement when dear ones died as a result of it. The strain of the people involved with the care, the, um, the health service, the um, people working the mortuaries, uh, a lot of people having to really extend themselves in uh, providing support during that time. Also many people losing their jobs, um, so having to endure financial hardship of one kind or another. Um, it hasn't been an easy time. And now a sense of just things gradually getting back to normal moving around a bit more. Uh, here at Miltium, we're beginning to have people come for the meditations, uh, beginning to go out and about a bit, to travel a bit more, and uh, a sense of a little bit sort of mirrored in the, in the spring, sort of just the uh, buds beginning to burst forth, the flowers appearing. Uh, in the woodlands, uh, grass beginning to grow, uh, these changes in nature, and uh, mirrored by just the, the sort of sense of beginning to make contact, to see people again, to have direct contact with people again, rather than always through this kind of Zoom technology, which has been rather wonderful, I have to say. Uh, it's enabled a lot of things, a lot of very good things to happen. It wouldn't have happened otherwise. The uh, ease of communication, of course, has also um, enabled people to have a much closer awareness of um, difficulties in the world, and particularly the war in Ukraine, which has really been headline news in the media, a very extremely shocking and disturbing event. And uh, I haven't been uh, watching TV, but hearing about it. And just in the, the little I've heard, you know, I find you know, profoundly um, disturbing, upsetting. And realizing that that's actually one of many conflicts. You know, these things are happening all over the world. Our human, our human family is in a state of distress. Uh, people are killing each other. How can you do that? Stealing, all kinds of transgressions against the five precepts that we determined together earlier on. And uh, just the enormous amount of suffering that is caused by these events. As Buddhist practitioners, we can feel tremendously privileged, tremendously grateful uh, that we have uh, guidelines that can support us in living in ways that 
uh, promote uh, clarity and, and ease of being. Um, however, I'm not sure how any of us would manage um, if we were put under the kind of pressures that many of the people that we hear about nowadays are, are under. So it's a, it's a very sobering reflection for us. And we can consider, well, how, you know, how can we best respond to all of this? What can we do? You know, often people I speak with, you know, there's a sense of, of helplessness, helplessness and hopelessness. And it can seem very awful, very out of control, very frightening and depressing. Yes. yes, I haven't even mentioned climate change. <laughs> Another, you know, impending, the sense of impending doom. You think about climate change. What can we do? How can we manage? How can we support some kind of a coming into balance in the world? And uh, it's interesting looking into the Buddha's life. And, um, and he lived in a time of relative calm. Um, but there were, there were wars, there were conflicts, um, and people going to battle, um, schisms in the Sangha, these terrible disagreements, with different factions of monks disagreeing with each other and refusing to uh, be guided by his advice about how to deal with the conflict. The quarrel at Kozumbi, some of you may have heard of, where you know, two factions uh, developed around a very, very a dispute about, around a very, very minor uh, transgression of, of the discipline and uh, talked about these sort of brawls breaking out in the, in the midst of the community and people wounding each other with verbal, verbal daggers and uh, the Buddha trying to get them to, to see sense and to realize that they didn't have to do this. And in the end, he, he kind of gave up. He, he could see that no matter how much he tried to bring reason to the situation, they, they, they weren't having it. And they said, you know, leave, our, leave us to sort it out. You, you go away and we'll sort it out. And so he went away. And uh, eventually the lay people who were supporting the Buddha and the disciples, they got so fed up that the Buddha had left, that they stopped offering food. And it wasn't long before the monks found a way to make up their, their difficulty. Um, unfortunately, most of the, well, the difficulties in the world are, are less easily resolved. Um, and there can be a sense of hopelessness, a sense of helplessness. And I was asked the question just a few days ago, how, how, to, how to deal with this? What, what can we as Buddhist practitioners do? And really what we can do is to carry on what we're doing, what we're doing as best we can. Taking the precepts, keeping the precepts as best we can. And when we really take these precepts, these guidelines on, we see that it's not, it's not so easy. You know, they sound very simple, these guidelines, not to deliberately cause harm to ourselves or to each other, not to, not to be dishonest in our dealings with others, not to exploit each other for, for sexual gratification, not to lie or to gossip or to cause division through our speech and refraining from intoxication, which of course, you know, makes us lose judgment. You know, we don't see clearly when we're intoxicated. Our judgment is affected. Our restraint goes out of the window. We can do or say the most outrageous things when we're intoxicated. So really taking these guidelines very, very seriously and recognizing that if, you know, if everybody made an effort to keep these precepts, the world would be a very different place. But we can't change the behavior of others, you know, even though it seems like a good idea, these are good things to be doing. 
what we can do though is change our own behavior, do the very best we can to understand greed, hatred and delusion, these causes of conflict and difficulty in the world. Understand these as they arise in our own mind and our own hearts. That's already a very significant contribution. It's so easy to judge, isn't it? To judge and to blame and to criticize, and pointing the finger. We shouldn't do this, they shouldn't do that. They should be punished. We should punish them, make them pay for what they've done. But does that really help? The understanding that can come about through Buddhist practice um, can have an enormous beneficial effect in our own lives and in the lives of others, lives of those around us. And when we really understand the nature of the human predicament and live our lives accordingly, um, we can find a great benefit just cultivating mindfulness, moment by moment awareness. is already a great help. I was thinking about a walk that we did yesterday, the three of us who were, who were staying here at the time, we went for a, a walk. And it was a, it was a, it was actually a big adventure. <laughs> it was a very exciting walk because what happened was it was uh, on, a, on a hill, we climbed this hill up to a, uh, an ancient monument and we enjoyed the view. And then um, we'd noticed, and I, I actually knew that there'd been um, a lot of trees had fallen down in a storm, a storm Arwen, that I think we all, we all experienced this wild storm that happened, swept across the country, I think it was November. Uh, last year, and enormous numbers of trees fell over. They were blown down in the storm. And I knew that one of the pathways had been quite badly blocked by these trees falling over. And uh, we were kind of debating which way we were going to go down. And I asked somebody, I said, did you come up from this particular place? And he said, oh, yes, yes, I did. And, I said, was the pathway clear? He said, yes, the pathway was clear. He said, the other pathway wasn't clear, but the pathway I came up was clear. So I kind of assumed that um, he was talking about the same pathway that I was thinking of that was clear. So we, we took our decision to set off down the straight pathway down the steep slope, uh, back to where, where, where the car was parked. And so we set off and it, it was pretty clear. And so, oh good, I'm glad we, we came down this way. And about, maybe it was about three quarters of the way down the path, we came upon these trees, lots and lots and lots of very big trees that had fallen over. And you may not have seen really big trees that fall over, but when a big tree falls over, very often, huge amounts of um, the soil around it you know, are uprooted. And so there's a big hole, huge hole, with craters uh, filled with rocks and stones and things. And so not only were there the trees falling across the pathway, um, all higgledy-piggledy all over the place, but there were also these big holes. And so of course there was the sort of decision you know, should we go back up the way we've come or are we going to just carry on down? And I suspect that out of the three of us, two of us were kind of in favour of carrying on. I suspect that one might have been more in favour of going back. I could be wrong about that. But anyway, the end, end result was that we carried on going down. And it was an exercise in mindfulness. It was wonderful because we had absolutely no choice but to be totally present. Uh, we could have, you know, I could have blamed myself for having made this decision to 
go in this particular way. I could have blamed the person we'd asked for giving us faulty instructions. I could have blamed myself for not understanding the instructions. You know, I could have got into a blaming mode. I could have got into a fearful mode. Oh, what's going to happen? Maybe I'll fall into a, into a crevice. You know, will, will we make it? Will, will, will we make it to the bottom? You know, how far is it? It looked impossible. I mean, it's just a mass of tree trunks falling over and big holes underneath. All higgledy piggledy. Anyway, um, as I said, there really wasn't a choice other than to just go very carefully, just to be fully present. Okay, we knew it was dangerous. At least I knew, I was very aware it was dangerous. You know, I'm older now and I could easily have lost my balance and fallen into a hole. And uh, it was quite interesting because I was also sort of thinking, there was, there was a thought, well, if I was 15 years younger, I would have been, I would, my, my balance would have been better. There wouldn't have been this danger, but you know, now I'm this age and so I need to be careful. So sometimes it was a matter of climbing over. Sometimes it was a matter of crawling under. Sometimes it was a matter of just kind of holding on to something or even going without holding on to something. Just every step was different. Every step we had to be present. Every step there was a moment we could have stepped into a hole. You, know, you couldn't always see where the holes were. So it was, a, it was an interesting uh, uh, walk. And you know, going ever so slowly, uh, tackling each kind of uh, mound of trees, one at a time, sometimes over, sometimes under, sometimes around, sometimes walking more to the right, sometimes more to the left, little by little, uh, we arrived. We got to the bottom. And I like to think that this is maybe how the whole of life is. If we can, you know, and we're not always in such a situation where there is this obvious danger. But I would like to suggest that perhaps rather than thinking about what's going to happen, will I ever get there? Uh, or blaming somebody for having made a mistake or blaming ourselves for having made a mistake. Can we just keep the mind steady? Can we hold steady moment by moment by moment? The current world situation, we can easily go into fear and worry and anger and rage and blaming and judging. And sometimes I think the media are actually encouraging us to do that. You know, the latest update, you know, and sort of prognoses, you know, will this happen, will that happen? I'd really encourage you to ration your um, intake of these media things and instead cultivate mindfulness. You know, just maybe allow 10 minutes a day of you know, checking the headlines, but that's enough. You know, be quiet, be still, come to the breath, come to the body, strengthen your mindfulness practice. That's the most important thing we can be doing. Cultivating a sense of joy that we are contributing through our presence, through our care, through our love of humanity. This is what we can do. When there's mindfulness, then actually we can discern if there is, maybe there is something we can contribute more obvious. You know, maybe we can have a gift of writing or a gift of speaking. You know, maybe we can have some kind of influence. But even if we can't, even if it's not an obvious external thing, we can live carefully and responsibly in our own sphere, knowing that uh, this has an effect on those around us. And as they're affected, they affect others. Don't underestimate the power of, of mindfulness. Don't underestimate the, the value, the beauty of sila. We're cultivating a sense of blessing in our lives, a sense of joyfulness, a sense of optimism, this can lift us up, not an unrealistic optimism, but a, a wise optimism. So these are a few words that I would like to offer as an encouragement, and I would like to 
keep the rest of the time just in case there are any questions about uh, what I've said or about your own practice or Buddhism. And uh, I offer these words for your reflection and encouragement and uh, I'm happy to receive any questions. If you want to write in the chat box, you can do that or raise your real or virtual hand. And then uh, uh, Nick, I think will invite you to unmute and uh, share your question. So you can just sit quietly until, until a question arises. Does anybody want to ask anything? So far, everything is silent on the question, Francis. Oh, that's, 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 that's good. <laughs> yes, digesting your words and reflections. <clears throat> Sister, we can't see you. Uh, your screen is off. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so hold on. Um, I don't think there's anything I can do. Um, no, no, you, we can see you now. You, you switched your screen We can on. see you now, yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. A bit more light. If there are no questions, um, what I would like to do is to offer a short meditation on just sharing of the blessings of our practice. Mm -hmm. um, but just another moment to see if a question arises, pops up for anyone. I can sort of perhaps ask a question. Um, well, actually, there is a question just arrived. A uh, question has just appeared in the chat box, which I will. How do we deal with problems with Buddhist people? Question mark. Problems with, with Buddhist people? Yes. Uh -huh. You mean Buddhist people um, I, making life it, difficult? It sounds like it would, it would need to be elaborated a bit, but the question is just yes. The answer has just appeared yes. Yes. Okay. Well, I live with people who are Buddhist. Most of the people I live with are Buddhist. And I tell you, where there are people, there are problems. <laughs> um, being Buddhist doesn't mean that they're not, they're, they don't create problems. Um, as long as there's greed, hatred, and delusion in our hearts, there, there are going to be problems. So, um, I think this, this question um, could equally be asked about how do we deal with, with people um, creating problems for us? And it's a good question, a very interesting question. Um, My answer to any question, the first thing I always say is, is mindfulness. Uh, because if somebody is saying things or doing things that we don't like or that we disagree with, uh, what happens most frequently if we're not mindful is that we react. And we might do or say something in response. Um, 
we might retaliate in some way. You know, if somebody says something we mean, we say something mean back. If somebody disagrees with us, we, we get into a, a dispute. Um, but as we reflect on our lives, as we study our lives, um, as we um, experience these kind of problems over and over again, we begin to see that reacting doesn't tend to produce a very fortunate result. Um, you know, something happens, we feel negative, we feel angry, irritated, upset, and we do or say something from that place. The Buddha was very clear about this. He said, if you do or say something from a place of um, uh, ill will or um, greed or desire of one kind or another, um, this does not lead to happiness. It says unhappiness will follow you like the uh, cart follows the hoof of the ox that draws it or something. Whereas if you do or say something from a heart of goodwill and kindness, generosity, then happiness follows you. So first thing is to be mindful. If somebody uh, behaves in a way that uh, we dislike or that we feel is wrong, and even if they're a Buddhist person who should know better, then we notice what happens in our own minds. We notice our inner, inner response. If we're quick to catch our inner response, there's a good chance that we'll be able to avoid allowing that inner response, that inner negativity to flow out into an outer response, doing or saying something as a reaction. So this is a very, I found very helpful. The way I do this is often through um, breathing, through bringing awareness to the breath rather than simply going up into the head and coming out with something. So anchoring the awareness with the breath, you know, just taking a very slow, easy inhalation and exhalation, bringing the awareness into the body and just having a pause and seeing what happens. It may be that just our silence acts as a kind of a mirror for that person. You know, one of the things that happens when we meditate is that we become much more sensitive. So if uh, the person who's winding us up is somebody who meditates, then our silence, our non-reactivity um, is often enough to enable them to see if they've done or said something unskillful. If not, and if we're able to be really present and um, uh, speak from a place of uh, inner balance, then we may be able to say something that will actually help the person to see uh, that what they're doing is perhaps not helpful in that particular situation. Um, I generally encourage this approach rather than actually showing or expressing our anger um, or irritation because in my experience, that never really brings a very good result. Um, other people may respond differently, you know, saying, well, surely there's a place for anger. But my suggestion would be is, yes, there's a place for the energy of anger, because that can um, enable us to channel that kind of energy in, in a good direction. But um, if we just lash out at somebody in a, as, as a reaction, that person is not really going to learn anything. All they're going to do is to notice that we're angry, that we're upset, that we're irritated. They're not going to really appreciate what it is that they've done that has caused that reaction. So, as I always say, yeah, mindfulness, establish presence. Um, and then we can consider what will be um, a skillful response. Sometimes it's best just to say nothing and perhaps later on, there'll be a, 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 an opportunity uh, to have a conversation when we're feeling more collected, more balanced. Um, and we can speak in a situation where the person can really hear 
what we have to say, what we have, you know, what our concern is about uh, the, the, the issue at hand. So these are a, a few reflections uh, that I'd like to share from my own practice. Um, and I hope that may be helpful. Um, Thank you, Sister. Is there anything else? Just the, the person who asked the question says, thank you, Sister. No, not easy to not be reactive. No, it's not easy. <laughs> and it's definitely worthwhile uh, working at, at cultivating this. Uh, in this way, we gradually transform the reactivity to a response to a wise, to a skillful, kindly response um, that can bring a much greater benefit both to the other person and to ourselves. Uh, it can strengthen our resolve to live in, you know, as a, as a true disciple of the Buddha. And interesting, there's a very lovely uh, reflection uh, that the Buddha gave to 1250 Arahant disciples who gathered spontaneously on the full moon of February, Magapuja. And uh, it's a teaching that says something like, you know, one who hurts or harms another is, is no disciple of mine. Um, and, and in another place, he says, and this is a really powerful teaching, he says, even if robbers grab hold of you and start cutting off your arms and legs, you know, if you react from a place of ill will, you haven't really understood my teaching. So it's a pretty... Um, exacting teaching. This doesn't mean that we never say anything that other people might not like to hear. You know, there are times when it's appropriate to speak out, but to learn how to do that from a place of inner balance, it, it gives a much more authority, much more weight when we can speak from a place of inner balance, you know, so that we're not just lashing out letting our, our anger go all over the place, like a fire, completely raging, completely out of control. You know, that's, that's, that's one thing that happens with anger. It feels hot and, it, and it, can, um, it can certainly do a lot of damage when it's not carefully um, channeled. But when it's carefully channeled, it can be like a laser and really um, uh, you know, get, get to the root of the problem. So it, living as a human being is, is not easy, but the Buddha did provide the most wonderful teaching uh, that can support us in learning how to do it in the best possible way to bring the maximum benefit to the maximum number of people. So I do encourage you to keep, to keep on with this practice, even though sometimes it feels like, like an enormous mountain that we have to climb. Uh, but if we just go one step at a time, you know, go carefully, uh, sooner or later, we we reach at our de we arrive at our destination. So, don't be discouraged, even if it seems difficult. It's it's definitely doable. So, thank you very much, sister. That's a wonderful answer to a challenging question. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at the time. It's coming up yes. for a couple of minutes before eight. I don't know. Whether you'd like to take another question or whether you'd like us to move on? What I'd like to do is I'd like us to maybe chant together the mm -hmm. uh, uh, reflections on universal well-being, yeah. which in itself is a complete package in yeah. terms of teaching and ways of directing the mind. Some of you will know it off by heart and... For others, it may be less familiar, but basically wishing well to ourselves um, as the first thing we do, and then wishing well to others, so cultivating a heart of kindness, uh, wishing that all beings may be released from all suffering, cultivating a heart of compassion, uh, wishing that those beings who have uh, goodness and beauty and whose lives are blessed and our own blessings in our own lives, may they not be separated from those blessings, so a heart of joyfulness and gladness, 
And then just recollecting that everything that we do in our lives has an effect. And using that as an incentive, as an encouragement to live carefully and responsibly and to avoid acting on uh, impulses of ill will and cruelty and greed and to cultivate um, a non-reactive or cultivate um, wholesome qualities and intentions in our lives. So a very powerful chant. So we'll chant this together and then we'll finish with the closing homage. <clears throat> Now let us chant the reflection on universal well-being. May I abide in well-being, in freedom from affliction, in freedom from hostility, in freedom from ill will in freedom from anxiety, and may I maintain well-being in myself. May everyone abide in well-being, in freedom from hostility, in freedom from ill will, in freedom from anxiety, and may they maintain well-being in themselves. May all beings be released from all suffering, and may they not be parted from the good fortune they have attained. When they act upon intention, all beings are the owners of their action and inherit its results. Their future is born from such action, companion to such action, and its results will be their home. All actions with intention, be they skillful or harmful, of such action, they will be the heirs. Thank you very much. And I think I'm going to be here again next week. So I look forward to seeing as many of you as can make it then. And um, I wish you well. And I do encourage you to keep up with your practice, ideally every day. Um, and uh, look forward to seeing you again. <laughs>